At Villarese Florist, we deliver the magic of flowers seven days a week to the North Shore and South Shore in the New Orleans area. Whether it's for birthday parties, baby celebrations, Villarese provides colorful floral displays for all. With a store full of fresh cut flowers, exotic tropical flowers, orchids, roses, and even fruit baskets, our goal is to make your vision a reality. Villarese Florist, proudly serving Louisiana since 1969. Homeowner's insurance increasing or deductible too high? Call, click, or come in. Save a Dave. Dave Miette Insurance Agency. For over 48 years, Southern Tires and Auto Repair has provided services across the New Orleans metro area. Southern Tires offers a range of tires for all vehicles and ATVs. We also have a full suite of auto repair options, including brake repair, rim repair, custom exhaust, steering and suspension, tire siping, and so much more. Southern Tires and Auto Repair, 2550 Hickory Avenue in Metairie. CNC Drugs is a family-owned pharmacy that's been serving Southeast Louisiana for over 50 years. Whether you need help taking care of an elderly family member, a growing child, or even a pet, CNC provides patient-centered care for your entire family. CNC Drugs, large enough to serve you, small enough to know you. Locations in Mandeville and Araby. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Can I say Happy New Year? Can I say Happy King's Day? Uh, uh, can I say Happy Twelfth Night? Uh, that, that's all what we're dealing with here in New Orleans and, of course, around South Louisiana as well. We are live from our Pontchartrain Production Studios, our first show of 2022. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, don't forget we're also live streaming on the WLE TV YouTube page. And uh, today, of course, we'll talk about Saints, LSU, Tulane. Want to get into uh, Dale Brown, the Pelicans. We'll try to cover it all here on Inside New Orleans Sports. Joining us on the program, uh, award-winning journalist and, of course, accomplished author, Les East of CrescentySports.com. Les, welcome to the show. Happy New Year to you, my friend. Did you have king cake for breakfast? I did not have king cake for breakfast, but we are officially in Mardi Gras season. Yes, we are. Correct. Uh, it seems like forever yes. since we have been. So yes. I will uh, be partaking of king cake yes. at some point in the near future. Well, Happy New Year to you too. I'm hoping that my wife will pick one up on the way home. <laughs> well, <laughs> she's watching. She now she knows. She already got the, the word before she left this morning. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, you know, it's a New Orleans tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, matter of fact. We, we actually got purchased a king cake to, to go on vacation to give to my daughter who lives in Nashville. But again, I refused to be able to cut the cake before King's Day. She was going to have a party, so she took it to the party. She's the one that's, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is out of the, uh, uh, the carnival season. I will only do it in carnival season. I'm a traditionalist. If, if you get the baby in Nashville, do right. you have to have another one shipped in? I'm hoping that if she got the baby in Nashville, she would at least buy me a king cake because I bought the one for her. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see how that plays seems out. seems fair. See how that plays out. Boy, a lot going on. You know, Les, first of all, Les uh, filled in for me um, on the radio show when I was out. Thank you again for doing that. Sure. Great job. also want to thank Will Hill, who again coordinated the, uh, the best ofs. While we we're out, Will, thanks again. Doing a fantastic job as always, but I'm, I'm raring to go. 2022, and my gosh, um, there's so much to talk about right now, and, and including with the New Orleans Saints who are still alive. Look, the theme this week on my show has been overcoming adversity, right? Oh, sure. And I, and I, and less. I mean, when you when you put it on paper, as I did on Monday, and you go down everything that has happened from again the displacement. 58 starters now again on, on, on the on, that, have, that have played the loss of again all pro players you lose your greatest player in franchise history and then you lose your starting quarterback four different uh, quarterbacks that have played that have started this mm -hmm. year you lose Kamara for four games I mean I can go on and on and on on, on the adversity this team has had to overcome and they're still standing which is amazing mm -hmm. 
with again going to Atlanta with a chance to be able to go to first of all have a winning season at nine and eight but again if Los Angeles takes care of business and they need to uh, they, they need to to win, to win the division and also to get the number two seed they take care of this against San Francisco you're in the playoffs with everything you've had to overcome I believe it's the greatest coaching job that Sean Payton has done since he's been in New Orleans it probably is. It, it's certainly uh, unique. He, he's never had to deal with anything no. and like then this. COVID nineteen too, right? Oh, oh, absolutely. Well, three times. Well, you've, yeah, you've had like three surges of right. COVID nineteen. Two separate games were played. Uh, if at least two, maybe three, with coaching staff absences due to COVID nineteen, mm -hmm. including Peyton himself, yes. where they go out and shut out the Super Bowl champs. And, you know, it, I'm glad you mentioned Breeze because so much has happened since August. It's easy to forget that 2021 began with the retirement of Drew Breeze. Right. And then all this other stuff has happened. They've, I believe they've played, what, seven games in their building? Mm -hmm. Everybody yes. else has played eight or nine. Right. They only got seven games yes. in their own building. Because right, the extra game went to Tennessee this year. Right. Okay, they'll get it back next year, but it went to Tennessee this year. And, of course, the season open was at Jacksonville. Yeah, so they had seven games in their building. Right. It, and then it, they haven't done well in the building at all, which is right. unusual. And they had a five-game losing streak just right. recently. Right. And they bounced back from that. From that. So I think what Saints fans should do sometime between now and kickoff on Sunday mm -hmm. is just take a minute especially if you're like us and you're old enough to remember right. when this was the worst franchise in the NFL. Right. But take a step back and look at everything that has happened and just appreciate the fact that on the last day of the regular season, they have a pretty good chance of getting into the playoffs. Yes. It's remarkable. But to get back to Sean, you know, he's done such a good job in so many seasons where they've – you know, won 12, 13 mm -hmm. games and, and made done damage in the playoffs, won a Super Bowl. But, yeah, when you look at what he's had to deal with, how different this year is, he's had to lean on his defense. Mm -hmm. He always leaned on his <clears throat> offense with yes. him and Drew. <coughs> and all the other adversity and the, the changing character of the team. And I think the single best thing he does, I, I wrote about this during training camp, and I think he gets this from Bill Parcells, is – you know, fundamentally, the job of the head coach is to understand the individual challenge each week and figure out how you can win that. Mm -hmm. And this year, it's been different every week. Right. You know, you're playing with a third-string quarterback, a rookie quarterback, without Camaro, without mm -hmm. your three-fifths of your right. offensive line, mm -hmm. all these different things. Every week, he's had to identify how can we possibly – meet this challenge and win. Now, they haven't always done it, right. but they've done it well enough to still be breathing going into the last game. It's been a remarkable coaching job by him, his staff, and a great job by the players. And, and, a, and in a season where offensively, well, for, for those that, again, have been used to a Sean Payton offense, uh, it's been different. It hasn't been as explosive. Uh, again, it's not an offense that you can count on to put points on the board for you. Mm -hmm. It's been a struggle from, again, going through multiple field goal kickers to, again, with the, the, the multiple quarterbacks. Look, we all know you lose your starting quarterback in the NFL, you're probably going to be a top 10 uh, selection in the draft. Mm -hmm. And they've been able to overcome that. Losing the quality depth. The, 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 the COVID-19 losses that the NFL put in this year's salary cap in a year where you knew you had to purge uh, uh, salary because of, again, paying the piper for years of kicking the can down the road with Drew Brees and others. Uh, this, uh, to be able to come back from that, again, guys that, are, again, were backups here that are starting for other teams now and then having to bring in undrafted free agents or, again, street free agents and get those guys ready to play, it's been a, a, a miraculous coaching job uh, from both sides of the ball by this coaching staff. Yeah, you lose the most prolific passer in the history of the NFL in the offseason, and you've had to use four different replacements during the season. Not because you didn't settle on no. a viable option. Right. You settled on a viable option, and mm -hmm. you had a second viable option yes. backing him up. It's all been injuries and COVID that have forced you to adapt to that. And I think he's shown... Uh, Peyton again showed remarkable discipline in not just saying well I've always been able to get out of trouble with my offense and my quarterback right. and my passing game we'll do it again no he said 
okay, the defense has to lead the way yes. for the most part this year. We have to run the ball. We have to play field position. Mm -hmm. We have to do all these different things. He was disciplined enough, smart enough, and put his ego aside enough to realize, hey, this is something we all have to adjust to and find a different way to win and modify that approach from week to week because the circumstances have changed so much. He, he'll get votes, but more, more than likely, Zach Taylor is going to be the coach of the year in the NFL. Or um, Mike Vrabel. Right, right. Okay, so you look at both of those guys, but then you look, if you really do a deep dive, which, again, a lot of the national correspondents don't do, you know, they're doing something from the outside more than anything else, and you see the, everything they had to overcome and where they are, and they make the playoffs, honestly, it, it, it's... It's unbelievable that, again, that he would not get coach of the year because of everything they've had to overcome. Yeah, well, certainly that they have to get into the playoffs right. for, for him to have I any chance I if they're 8-9 and nine or right. even 9-8 and eight and don't right. get right. in. You don't, give, you don't give coach of the year to a team that has a losing record. Right. Or, or even, again, doesn't make the postseason. Right. But at 9-8, and eight, that would be the final check mark on, on the, the, the resume for coach of the year. I don't think he'll get it. Neither do I. He, he's never gotten it. Right? No, never. Uh, neither did Phil Jackson. Right. Okay. Everybody sell. Great Phil point. Jackson, he's got the best players. Right. He won 11 NBA yeah. championships, yeah. six with one franchise, mm -hmm. five with another, yes. two different eras with the second team. Mm -hmm. But he never did the best coaching job right. in a single season. Crazy. So it doesn't mean anything that he doesn't get it. It would be nice if it got recognized. I think mm -hmm. uh, if there were an award that would uh, Coach of the Year award that was based exclusively on the votes of the peers, mm -hmm. uh, I think he probably would have won one by now, and he'd yeah. have a stronger candidacy well, this year. Look at 06. And also, 09. I, I should mention, Bill Belichick also deserves right. some consideration oh, no this doubt. year. I would agree. No question. You I think no you're right. Probably in Cincinnati <clears throat> is where it's going to go. But. Well, and then adversity. And maybe, you know, may, maybe this is a little bit over the top, but I've talked about this over the, over the last uh, week. I got to go back to the 2005 Saints to talk about the uh, a team having to overcome the adversity this team has had to overcome. Now, again, the 2005 Saints, obviously, again, Hurricane Katrina being displaced, having to go to San Antonio. We know the story, the backstory with, again, Tom Benson wanting to move the team, everything that was going on there, all, all the whole cloud. I mean, for a lot of us that were trying to rebuild, just kind of get, get our, ourselves together back then, it's kind of a blur. But you look at, again, what the team had to deal with, what, practicing in a parking lot in San Antonio? Yeah. Th this mirrors that, if not even more, because it's been every single week, it's been a different thing that you had to overcome. Yeah, it, 2005 is unique, and I think 2021 is unique also mm -hmm. in, in a different way. Uh, the, the magnitude of what everyone was dealing with in 2005 mm -hmm. yes. it, it just puts it in a separate category but this one from a football mm -hmm. standpoint of everything they've had to deal with in addition to the hurricane and covid mm -hmm. um it's uh, a challenge that i I, uh, I can't think of anything comparable for the saints or anybody else mm -hmm. in recent years and for them to be sitting where they are now uh is just Amazing, and like I said earlier, I I, I think it, we don't know what's going to happen on Sunday. No. Maybe it's a disappointing it could end, be. but just take a minute right. and appreciate the opportunity that's there, yes. and then enjoy Sunday because the, most of the teams in the NFL don't have that opportunity right. on Sunday. I, I watched the the post practice interview with Matt Ryan mm -hmm. yesterday, getting ready for the Saints, yes. and he's sitting there like a lot of NFL players right now, and he's asking the questions about. Do you hope Corderell Patterson's back with the right. team next year? Right. What can y'all take into the off season? Yes. You know, they have a game to play Sunday, right. and he's having to answer all these questions about the future mm -hmm. because they know they're going nowhere. Right. The Saints have a chance to go somewhere under incredibly challenging circumstances. Take a moment to appreciate the opportunity and then just enjoy Sunday I no agree. matter what happens. I agree, 100 no, percent. There's no doubt about it. Defensively, they've carried the day. They really have. And I give Dennis Allen a lot of credit. My hope is, again, selfishly, that he doesn't end up as, as, a, as a head coach for another team. But, again, I, there's, how could you not take, not take a second look at him after what he has done week to week with this defense? Well, you have to. And I, I, I think that game against Tampa Bay put him on 
the radar mm -hmm. for some teams when he might not have otherwise right. been there because it was a national TV game. He was acting head coach. And, and his defense shuts out Tom Brady while he's being in acting head coach. Right. I mean, it's just an incredible performance, and, and the whole country mm. saw it. So I think a lot of teams that are going to look for coaches have to say, oh, that's a guy we need to talk to. And in all the professional leagues, they love to hire people who have had other opportunities, mm -hmm. no matter how well or poorly they did. And can you really hold the Raider opportunity against him? Consider, right. Considering that front office, right. that ownership group. So um, I think the fact that uh, he's had a previous opportunity mm -hmm. certainly helps him. And, and yes. he didn't fall on his face no. there. It just didn't work out great. And he, he's done a great job as a D.C. And then that Tampa Bay game and what the defense has done all year. Uh, I, I would assume he, he will get an interview somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many openings there are going right. to wind up being. But I would expect he would get an interview somewhere, and uh, it would be a big loss for the Saints if he left, but it would be a well-deserved opportunity if it were to no, happen. No doubt about it. And the coaching staff across the board has really done a great job. And that, that really is, look, that's been kind of the bedrock this season. With, ev with everything, again, been a revolving door of players in and out of the, uh, uh, the facility, in and out of the starting lineup. I mean, taking guys off the street. And, and uh, I looked at the defensive tackle position, and I mean, I almost had to laugh. You know, I mean, Ringo comes in, and, and mm -hmm. he's been a bona fide player for him. Huggins has, has come in and played. We knew what Tuttle was, okay, uh, on top of Anya Mata missing six games. I mean, it's been amazing, again, how well uh, this team has been able to play considering the type of players they've had to bring in off the street. In some cases, I mean, again, look, I think it's a record now. Mike Triplett had his 58 new, uh, starting new starters on, on the team at, uh, throughout the season, and I think it's an NFL record. I, I would hate to see the team that did right. more than that if there is such a team. Uh, a few things about the, the organization, okay? First of all, obviously the players and the coaching staff have mutual respect for one mm -hmm. another, and that's been huge in getting through this. The coaches have trusted players who do not have a track record to do the job, mm -hmm. and those players trusted the coaches to prepare them to handle responsibilities they weren't supposed to be handling at this point. Mm -hmm in their career, but also the front office and, and Terry Fontenot, who's mm -hmm. in Atlanta now, yes. and Mickey Loomis right. and uh, Jeff Ireland, yes. all those people. Th not only did they bring in people to fill in those holes on the depth chart to mm -hmm. give them enough depth <clears throat> to get by, even with the salary cap issues, but we talked in 2017 about how they had that three-year run that right. was bad, and that's because they not only missed on free agency, but they had uh, guys who weren't up to the type of character that they've had in right. the ba in the past. Yes. And they've talked so much about that the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Bringing in guys like Demario Davis right. and going back to drafting Cam Jordan and, and mm -hmm. other people, Ryan Ramchek, yes. who's been hurt, Teron Armstead's been hurt. But these are all leaders on the team and Alvin Kamara. And in 2017, they rebuilt the locker room as well as the roster mm -hmm. and the character that they brought in enabled them to overcome the adversity. If they had the same talent level mm -hmm. and the lack of character that they had from 14 through 16, yes. we wouldn't be talking about this no. the way we're talking about it no, now. No. And that's why, again, you don't see this in professional sports. You just don't see, again, a team being able to overcome this type of adversity each and every week and still be standing in, in, in the last week of the season. And again, it goes back to, and I agree with you, uh, Breeze and Peyton developed the culture here in New Orleans. It's been passed down now, if again, if you want to say the air quotes, generations of players, and there's a new mm -hmm. generation of players that now are learning from the Cam Jordans, the Demario mm -hmm. Davises uh, of Malcolm the world. Jenkins, Malcolm I Jenkins, I should Yeah, throw it all in there because, again, that that you, the, if you don't have the culture that they have in the locker room, they're not out there again playing for each other as they're doing, and and you're not seeing them having the success they've had. And look, they're 500. The, you know, normally you talk about a Saints team that's 500. That is a letdown. But based on everything we've seen this year, it's remarkable. Yeah, it is. And the thing, you know, you have to point out that, you know. They didn't, didn't have to be in this type no, of situation. That's right. They should have beaten the Giants. Giants they should have beaten Carolina, the Falcons. Right. Yeah. And Carolina. I said those three. Yeah, those Carolina. Because they were healthy them. then. They were healthy. They were them. healthy. 
but Carolina, they were missing all those coaches True. because of COVID. Carolina was a much better team back they then. Had, they had they McCaffrey, played, right, if I'm They saying. had McCaffrey. Yes. They, had, they, they were playing well the yes. first month of the season. So I don't put that one quite in the same category because mm -hmm. the Giants, they had a double-digit lead in the right. fourth quarter. The Falcons, they take a lead with a minute and one yes. second left, and they couldn't so, hold it on. Some self inflicted so, wounds. What's that? Some self-inflicted wounds. Absolutely. And, and they're, they're still haunted by yes. th those two or three games. I thought they would be. Uh, but nonetheless, there have been so many others. You know, that five-game losing streak could have crushed yes. a lot of teams. Mm -hmm. And then they went up to New York and they took care of a bad Jets mm -hmm. team, but mm -hmm. they did it in methodical fashion, right. even though they were still shorthanded. They did get Kamara back, mm -hmm. which helped. The, the win at Tampa Bay is, is one of the most remarkable wins in the history of the franchise. I agree. Right? Top five, if yep. not top one or two. That was incredible. And then to have the, the game that never should have been played against the Dolphins, right. to come back from that and win again last mm -hmm. week shorthanded, getting more players back this week, they have a chance to win. I, I just uh, – now Peyton said this yesterday himself. You know, they haven't handled everything – perfectly along the way, but they've handled a lot well to get to this point. Uh, if anything, they've set, they, they've set the, 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 the bar on, again, having to overcome the adversity in terms of the professional ranks. Because, look, a lot of teams are going through this, right? Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of them don't have the ability to, to be able to get through it. Now, again, a lot of it is, again, the investing in, in the defense over the last few years, and that has paid off now. It's paying some dividends. There are some guys that are, are, are got some, 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 niche, some niche guys that are out there right now, like a P.J. Williams, Gardner Johnson. Uh, you, you look at, again, uh, what, what they're doing in terms of when, when they're on the field, Quan Alexander, how much more than those guys mean. But every level of that defense has had to step up and for the most part throughout the season they have. Look, I've been a little bit down on the second, third levels at times uh, because there have been some injuries with, with, with uh, the first level. But, again, Cam Jordan, what he's done in the last few weeks, which has been, which has been outstanding, You're being able to get Davenport back. Uh, and then, of course, they're flying around. The intensity, I thought it was the most physical game I've seen in the game against Tampa Bay uh, by this team since, again, the playoff run and ultimate Super Bowl run in 2009. Yeah, it was uh, a tremendous defensive performance. Cam Jordan the last three weeks is one of the most unbelievable things right. I've seen. Uh, I mean, he was still a very good player. Sure but was. A lot of us were wondering, right. has he started to decline yeah. a little bit? Mm -hmm. he, now, he had off-season surgery yes. before last season mm -hmm. that I think slowed him last season. But he's been around a long time. His stats weren't as good, but a lot of that is because guys on the other side weren't available and he was getting double teamed a right. lot. Davenport comes back to get depth on the defense, the interior back, and all of a sudden he's able to go one-on-one -on -one more often. Right. He got the week off in New York because mm -hmm. of COVID, right. ended his streak. And all of a sudden he came back and it was like the fountain of youth. Mm -hmm. The last three weeks he's played as well as probably any defensive lineman has ever played right. for three weeks. Well, like NFC Defensive Player of the Week two out of the last three weeks, right? Yeah, seven and a half sacks, right. I believe, yes. in, in three weeks. Right. Well, you know, Tom shuts out Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. um, just incredible. But, you know, throughout the defense, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, C.J. Gardner-Johnson. He was phenomenal right. in that game yes. as well. Um, I, I talked about this once before. I think he's done such a good job of – staying away from stupid penalties yes, while the NFL is looking more closely mm -hmm. at trash talking and yet not losing his personality. Mm -hmm. And still, he got inside Tom Brady's mm -hmm. head he without getting a penalty, without getting ejected, mm -hmm. and had a little fun with him on Twitter yep. afterwards. So he's really uh, been important. P.J. Williams has uh, had his best year important. as a pro. Yeah, he's and, and I, again, I think the, the patience of the organization with a guy like P.J. Williams, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. One-year deals, had the DUI, uh, but again, found a niche for him. Well, again, where he's playing, and he's played that position well. Yeah. Look, look he's one of the best tacklers on this team uh, for the secondary. Mm -hmm. And then look at Adebo, starting every game as a rookie. When we were all talking in training camp, what are they going to do? They bring in Roby, who's been a, a, a nice a nice addition. No, across mm -hmm. the board, tremendous amount of credit goes to the front office, but again, mostly to, again, the, the, the players, the culture, and, and the coaching staff for where they are. Now, let's talk about Atlanta. Look, Atlanta, mm -hmm. Saints are a better team than Atlanta, but you throw out the records with, with this rivalry. Now, the, mm -hmm. the question is, again, 
Are you going to get a team with Atlanta that wants to be the spoiler to keep the Saints out of the playoffs? Or are you getting guys that, again, they're already looking to go on vacation? And that's the question. I think they got to get an early lead, which is something they haven't been able to do all season long. I don't think they've scored a touchdown on their first drive all season long. But I think that may be, that may be the key to success this weekend. Yeah, I think uh, to get to your first point about the Falcons, I, I think they will begin the game as the passionate rival of the Saints that wants to ruin the Saints season. Okay. But lurking over their shoulder is the team that's putting together tea times and getting ready for the off season. Mm -hmm. And if they find themselves, it may not take a lot to break them and to have them just settle in as like, okay, we're, we're just gonna get this season over with. They might not have Kyle Pitts, right. who missed practice yesterday. Mm -hmm. The hamstring injury, that would be a big loss. Uh, I think this game, a fast start would certainly be helpful, but I think it all comes down to uh, turnovers and disrupting Matt Ryan. Yes. Ryan threw for 343 yards in the first game. It looked like a gazelle out there rolling yeah. out, did he? Yeah, it was a season high in yards. He bought time. They only sacked him twice. He uh, made a lot of plays. Mm -hmm. Didn't turn the ball over, ran for a touchdown, and uh, ultimately that was the difference in the game. The uh, Falcons <clears throat> didn't even really try and run the ball. Mm -hmm. It was just the way they passed it. Yes. The Saints, Peyton made a uh, good point yesterday. He said that in the first game, you know, because Arthur Smith is a first year head coach, mm -hmm. he was OC of the Titans. You could see in the first game, and I'm sure they saw this on film prior too, but it, Ryan <coughs> is going through his progressions, making a choice, delivering the ball a beat or two faster yes. than he was in the previous offense. Now that the Saints have experienced that on the field, I think they'll be better prepared to slow down Ryan. I think they'll do a better job against the passing game in this game than they did in the first, but that isn't necessarily enough. They need to be balanced on offense and need to win the turnover battle, and if they could win the special teams, that would be huge. Yeah, I would agree. You picking them this week? Do you think the Saints wins it? Win, win the game? I think they'll win uh, simply because they have uh, so much at stake. Mm -hmm. They're getting players back. We don't know exactly how many. It's hard for me to picture Sean Payton losing to Atlanta twice in right. one season. Yes. Uh, so I think they'll win, but I do think it will be a tough game, a close game, uh, a tension-filled game yes. in New Orleans, sure. I believe. Um, but, yeah, I think they'll find a way to win because I think they're the better team and they have more to play for. Of course, that game has now been flexed to a 325 uh, kickoff. It'll be playing the same time as the Rams and 49ers. Again, for the Saints to be able to get into the playoffs, they need a victory at Atlanta. And then, of course, the Rams need to beat San Francisco. They've lost to Frisco five times, but as Les mentioned early in the program, uh, San Francisco's got some quarterback problems. We'll, we'll see how that kind of plays out. San Francisco also playing for their uh, uh, playoff lives as well. Yeah, they're, uh, you know, if they win, they're in. Right. They if, lose. They, if they lose and the Saints, Saints win, win, they're out. Right. But the Rams are playing for possibly the number two seed. Right. So they have. And the division championship. And the division championship. So they have uh, an awful lot to play right. for. The key there, I think, is a quarterback in San Francisco, Jimmy Garoppolo. Mm -hmm. I think his thumb injury is worse than mm -hmm. what Taysom Hill had when right. he was first hurt. He's practicing, but he's in a lot of pain based on what they say in mm -hmm. San Francisco. So they have to decide if going with the more experienced quarterback is worth the risk to ball security mm -hmm. that that injury will present yes. in terms of accuracy and holding on to the football against the Rams pass rush, mm -hmm. which is really good. But Kyle Shanahan is a very good coach, oh, yeah. and I think he'll have them ready to do the best and, they can. And the Rams are all in. They've done everything they can to be able to stack this roster for this season. So yeah. we'll see again how that kind of plays out. And, of course, if the Saints do win, and the Rams uh, uh, win, win their division. The Saints will take on the Rams in the first game of the uh, of the wild card weekend. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to jump to some LSU, uh, which we get to the Pelicans as well, and, and to some Tulane. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Les East, award-winning journalist and accomplished author, is, is our guest. We'll be right back. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration has been family-owned and operated since 1989. Burkhart has energy-efficient solutions and offers brands such as Mitsubishi ductless AC units and Amena, the only manufacturer with a lifetime unit replacement warranty. 
Burkhart's offers maintenance bundle packages that include servicing your AC, generator, and tankless water heater. For more information on the services Burkhart's provides, visit acpromise.com. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration, providing comfort for life. Located at 3701 Iberville Street in Mid-City is Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Open seven days a week, Katie's offers daily specials for lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Serving New Orleans cuisine such as fried shrimp platters, grilled redfish, and a fully stocked bar. And don't forget about our expanded event seating and local entertainment. Featured on the best of food networks, diners, drive-ins, and dives, Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Les East is with us. Les, before we usually do this at the top of the show, let's do this now, though. You're with CrestedCitySports.com. Also, I want you to tell us everything you're involved in, and don't forget about, again, telling the folks about your book as well. Thanks, Eric. Uh, first of all, CrescentCitySports.com. Of course, in addition to all our regular thorough coverage of the Saints, Pelicans, LSU, Tulane, UNO, uh, this week is the All-State uh, Prep, All-State Sugar Bowl mm -hmm. Prep Classic Basketball Tournament at the Ilario Center. Mm -hmm. Started yesterday with the girls bracket, mm -hmm. today the boys bracket. Um, a full schedule on Friday, <clears throat> championships on Saturday. We'll be live streaming the championships on Saturday, and we'll also have thorough coverage on the website each day. It started mm -hmm. yesterday, so uh, a lot going on there. Great tournament, a lot of uh, local yeah. and from around the country high school basketball uh, boys and Glad girls. Glad to see that revived. Yeah, it, it's uh, missed <coughs> the last two years because mm -hmm. of COVID, but it's <clears throat> back um, at the Ilario Center yes. on the West Bank. So check that out. If you can't get out there, Go to CrescentCitySports.com, uh, writing about LSU for SaturdayDownSouth.com. The book is called uh, Donkeys, Elephants, and Giraffes. It's a uh, political novel mm -hmm. about politics and the media and sports to some degree and is available at all the major platforms online, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, etc. And I highly recommend it. It's a really good book. Check it out. Thank you. Saints, uh, we talked Saints, let's talk LSU now. Six and seven, the end of season three and five overall. Look, the Texas Bowl was weird because, again, you had all the opt-outs. You had the you had the uh, uh, the uh, those that went into the transfer portal. They had 39 scholarship players available. Now, first of all, I said this on on on, uh, on Wednesday that it was great to see the non-scholarship players, the walk-ons, get a chance to play in a game. You know, they're all the time. Again, they're there. They practice. They do everything that the that the, that the, the scholarship players do. They just they're on the sidelines. You don't get a chance to see them unless it's a blowout. So from that standpoint, for their families, etc., you know, it was good to see that. But that was a shell of an LSU team. And, mm -hmm. when, and, and uh, again, I, I, the list, this is too long for me to do this on television of the number of players, uh, quality players that weren't on the field for the Tigers, which leads me again to the NCAA and what we've seen now over the last few years with COVID now, opt-outs, the ability to be able to transfer without any penalty, transfer within the conference in a lot of cases without mm -hmm. any penalty. I really think that, again, the NCAA has to take a second look at the transfer portal. There has to be a time frame here on when a, when a, when a student athlete can transfer. You can't transfer in the middle of the season. You shouldn't be able to transfer before a bowl game. You know, there, there should be a, 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 a time frame there. As far as the opt-outs go, I just think the opt-outs are hard because, again, a lot of these kids are opting out to go to the pros. So, again, you can't really tell a kid not to opt out. You know, but ultimately, again, that comes, comes between the, the, you know, the, the, the kid, their parents, uh, obviously, again, the, uh, the, <coughs> the, the team, uh, and, and whether they're going to play or not. Uh, the, I think it's what is, what's happening right now is it, it's putting the bowls in a position where they're going to be obsolete. You know, when you get to this yeah. situation where you've got so many kids that are transferring out, opting out, and then you have a shell of a team that it was, you know, the bowl, I grew up with the bowls. I think the bowls were a big part of what college football is. But, you know, and, and it's supposed to be a reward for, for having a great season. But in a lot of cases, kids are only, we're only worried now about being in that championship series, okay, or in the playoffs. And ultimately, the Bulls are, again, kind of looking, uh, going to the wayside. I think it hurts the Bulls. I think it hurts the cities that ultimately, again, host these Bulls, including in a city like ours that mm -hmm. needs that. And the prestige of, again, what the Bulls once were and could be part of. Uh, I'd like to get your take on that. I mean, it, can we go down this road as we're going now, or do there have to be some tightening up or changes to, to again, make this 
uh, a little bit more palatable for just for not just the fan, but also for again, for those that are uh, that are coaching. And the same thing goes for coaches as well. Moving the national uh, the early signing period stops coaches like Brian Kelly from walking away from Notre Dame to go to LSU. I think they have to rethink a lot of things on the calendar of what's happening with college football right now. Yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff um, that needs to be worked through, and unfortunately you can usually count on the NCAA not to figure out a good solution no doubt. to these challenges. Um, they have to try and do something because we're headed to we're headed away from – relevance for the bowls we have been for a long time mm -hmm. and something's got to be done to try and uh, stop that process they've tried every step of the way from the the bowl alliance and the bcs and the cfp and all of this stuff they've tried to maintain a significant role for the bowls in the postseason mm -hmm. they've done a fairly good job of doing that but we're getting farther and farther away from it mm -hmm. lsu is an extreme example but we're going to see more examples mm -hmm. similar to that where you right. essentially have a JV team. That's what it was. Going out there. You know, if you told me John Trey Kirkland was going to throw three touchdown passes <laughs> before the game, right. I would have said, well, <coughs> L wow, LSU's going to win. Right. Uh, but they didn't have enough players. No. So uh, that's a real problem. I don't know exactly what they can do. Maybe there's something they could do and that this would require legal <clears throat> minds beyond me. Uh, but maybe they can somehow tie the NIL opportunities to playing in a bowl game. Mm -hmm. You can get X amount of value from something we're planning as a team mm -hmm. using your <clears throat> NIL, but you only get it if you participate in the bowl game. I don't know if they can. there's a way they can do that right. fairly, uh, <clears throat> but that's something you have to make it worth a player's while to – stay for the bowl game and right now more and more players and especially more and more agents are figuring out there's no real point mm -hmm. in my guy playing in this game and unfortunately the unfortunate injury to Matt Corral yeah. the Ole Miss quarterback in the Sugar Bowl mm -hmm. illustrates the risk these guys take by playing and Matt Corral did <clears throat> the right thing did. by his teammates yes, and so I want to play again with these guys and he gets hurt I'm sure he'll be fine he'll get drafted high he'll mm -hmm. be an NFL player but it just reinforces the notion that what's in it for the player right and I don't know that anybody has an answer for that right look it's hard on one hand, again, I want to see the players have the same freedom as a coach does to be able to move mm -hmm. on. If they, if, again, it's not working out for them in terms of their situation. But there has to be a time frame which you can do that so you're not, there's just not a, a mass exodus. Also, again, the, the, the ability to be able to, again, uh, get money for, uh, for your name, image, and likeness. The ability to get, uh, get paid in, in some form or fashion. I have no problem with any of that. But I just think that you have to go at this and, and, and have a way to be able to preserve the integrity of the game. And when you're sending out 39 scholarship players and, and a bunch of walk-ons to play in a bowl game, again, it, it, it's unfair to the audience. It's unfair to the universities as well. Uh, but on, on the flip side, you look at a guy like Matt Corral, go back to old Ben Wilkerson, again, the center for LSU back mm -hmm. when, when he hurt himself. And really, it, it killed his career as an NFL player. He was thought to be, I think he was the Outland Trophy winner that year. Right. And he was thought to be, again, the top center coming out the draft. He was, he was thought to be a guy that was going to play center in the NFL for 10 years. He hurts his knee in the bowl game. And then ultimately, again, he's never the same player, ever. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's a risk that you take every time you take the field. But there has to be, again... Um, some level of fairness, but also, again, uh, the ability to be able to, again, keep teams together, at least for the, the season, and, and then have these kids transfer out. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what the solution is. Maybe, you know, we've seen instances before where players have taken out insurance policies. To, right protect themselves against the risk of injury in certain situations. But that's really kind of guys that, are, again, are upper echelon that are going to the NFL, right? right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, a lot of kids are leaving now simply because they got beat out. Okay? Correct. And, and I, I don't think that's good for any sport. No, it's you not. You know, it's just not. Again, look, look at just this year with the LSU quarterback situation. You know, if, if, if um, uh, the kid that went to um, uh, Auburn um, got oh, um from T.J. Finley. T.J. Finley. If Finley sticks around, he's starting in, in, in the bowl game, right? Right. Okay. Max Johnson leaves, okay? Uh, Miles Brennan goes to the, port, uh, the transfer portal. All three of these guys were there, and then all three were gone. Yeah. Now, again, Miles Brennan coming back. So, again, 
I, I don't know what happened, but somewhere along the line, kids got afraid of competition. Look, the NFL is going to find you. Okay, they'll find mm -hmm. you wherever you are if you're a good enough player. Uh, but again, it's interesting that we're seeing this type. Now, again, LSU's a perfect storm here. Uh, coach situation, Coach O leaves, obviously gets fired. They, they keep him around for a while. Supposedly now, again, there's problems within the academic side now where kids weren't going to class during that time, which could end up hurting Brian Kelly down the line here. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the defections, the opt-outs. Opt it's really a perfect storm for LSU right now. And look, for a situation that I thought might be a one-year rebuild with Brian Kelly, maybe a little bit longer because of, again, what we're seeing in the NCAA right now when it comes to, to football. Now, look, the portal goes both ways, but yet there is a... Um, the, there is a, a ceiling on, again, the number of players you could bring in per year. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's <clears throat> certainly more than a one-year rebuild for Brian Kelly. He's got, I believe, 13 signees yeah. so far. He'll probably add a few. Uh, fortunately for LSU, I believe the, the, the Baton Rouge Bureau of the uh, transfer portal now has an entrance sign on right. instead of just the exit and it was only an sign exit for that was on right. for a long Ooh. time. So I think he'll uh, he'll add a few players that way because I think he has a lot to mm -hmm. offer. He mm -hmm. said, "Hey, look, this is LSU, and right. we need players. Come here and you know, you you'll make start. a name for yourself." Right. So, uh, but there's only so much he can do for next season, right. and uh, so I think it's going to be a multi-year rebuild. But right. he's got especially with all the defections we've seen, which again, <clears throat> I don't think a lot of people thought we were going to see. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that, that's, that's it's tough, but we'll see. We'll see how it plays. I just I think I'm not against it. Transfer portal, not against NIL, not against these things. I just think that we need to take a step back now and realize, okay, uh, it, it's pretty much chaos right now, yeah. and you've got to be able to organize it. Well, the thing is, for the longest time, the NCAA got away with treating <clears throat> student athletes like slave labor. Right. It's and true. suddenly, student athletes have freedom and they have power. Yes and the toothpaste is not going back in the tube. No. So I don't think they can say, oh, we gave you too much freedom right. that we denied you for all those right. years. We want to take some of your freedom back. No, no, that's not going to happen. Right. So I don't know that they can pull it back yeah. at all. I think this is the growing pains that we have to go through to make amends for not treating student athletes right for as long mm -hmm. as we allowed them not to be treated right. right. Agreed, agreed. See, but again, then you look at a program like Tulane, okay? How much this can hurt a program like Tulane down the line. Can Tulane complete, compete in the NIL, okay? Are they going to be able to compete on, on, on that level? When it comes to the transfer portal, obviously, again, uh, they, they'll be able to, to, to get, they, we're seeing it now, ex-high school players from, from New Orleans going back to Tulane. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and and making it they didn't go make it in their first school or decided it wasn't for them coming home. How much does that affect them down the line here with the transfer portal, um, and especially going into a new conference now? Well, this thing, but again, I, I do, it's going, the conference changing for them now with again the defections of, of the of the uh, of the four big bigs to uh, uh, the Big Twelve. It'll be interesting to see again how this affects Tulane going forward. Yeah, it will be. Uh, Tulane will not be a big player in the NIL, but that doesn't mean there won't be some sort of niche that mm -hmm. they can find for right. their better players. Um, I, and I think Tulane is an attractive uh, university, and I, I think some players, after a year or two in other places, mm -hmm. as they <clears throat> start to look at their life beyond college, might start to realize, you know, I can have a pretty good football career at Tulane, and I'll, I can also set myself up for non football with a Tulane degree. Right, exactly. I, I think the transfer <clears throat> portal can mm -hmm. uh, be helpful to Tulane. Mm -hmm. I, I think they'll also lose people like everybody else. Right. Uh, but Tulane, they, they're going to have to utilize all their opportunities to get players, but it's going to be a little easier to compete in the conference going forward. Well, there's no doubt. And, and, and that's what I w I've been saying to Tulane fans for a while now. They're upset uh, that Tulane did not get involved in, again, possibly moving to a bigger conference. They, they don't deserve it at this point. The, eventually, maybe mm -hmm. they will. But a new AAC, the way it's going to be now, they are going to compete for championships in every sport. And I think in a few years from now, Tulane fans are going to be celebrating the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, they'll be one of the top echelon teams in, the, in a new re uh, revamped AAC. Yeah, I think it is going to be a better situation for Tulane if you look at it realistically and not idealistically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, certainly uh, Tulane would like to be competing in a bigger mm -hmm. conference and, and for a CFP berth, but realistically, that's not going to happen. Right. They are what they are. 
Uh, they made that choice when they left the SEC mm -hmm. uh, more than half a century ago, and, and we, we can debate whether that was good, bad, or mm -hmm. indifferent. But uh, they are what they are now, and uh, I think they're gonna, they can have a nice little place competing in a good but not great conference. Shifting to the Pelicans, um, uh, came out yesterday that um, uh, Zion Williamson is, is going to rehab in Portland. Uh, again, uh, the, the summer trying to make a big deal out of this. I see no problem with it. If you're going to have him in a situation where, again, he's going to concentrate uh, with, again, the best uh, that they're dealing with in his type of injury, why wouldn't you? You don't necessarily, you, know, you go to a specialist to have that type of surgery. If you have to go to a certain specialist in order to rehab that surgery, so be it. Whatever has to happen. To me, it's not a big deal. The big deal to me is that this team has to add some quality veterans before the trading deadline. They are playing much better. They seem to be buying into what Willie Green is selling, but they need help. You can no longer wait on Zion Williamson. Right. Uh, two quick things about Zion. I agree. Uh, I don't have a problem with what they're doing. He can't, he's not doing any team activities no, he's now. Not. He's nowhere close to being able to play in a game. Mm -hmm. um, he can rehab elsewhere as well as he can rehab here. It's best just to get him away. Right. Don't let the team be a distraction to his rehab. Don't let his rehab be a distraction to the team. Just move it. <clears throat> it's better for the team to separate him mm -hmm. right now because he's not part of the team. Right. Let him focus on what he's got to focus on. If he doesn't come back till training camp, so be it. The way it is. That's what you have to do. Uh, so I don't have a problem with that. I think psychologically it's better for the team. It's mm -hmm. better for Willie Green mm -hmm. so that we don't every fourth or fifth day after practice have to ask anything new with Zion. Right. You know. Uh, but, you know but you have to ask that question. Sure, you have to ask it. But, you know, that's a question for David Griffin yes. or the medical staff. That's right. You know, Willie Green's got a team. Okay? Right. He's trying to get this team right. into the playoffs. Th those guys are, are persona non grata right now. You right. can't find that. Right. He's just saying it's, it's, all, it's a repeat <laughs> right. of the Anthony Davis thing with, with Alvin Gentry. With Alvin Gentry. When they weren't playing him, and Alvin yeah. would stand there every right. day, and I did this at least a half a dozen mm -hmm. times. I'd ask him about it, and he would get so frustrated with me because mm -hmm. he, he couldn't answer it, right. honestly. But you had to ask the question. Right. So, you know, that's unfortunate. But right. now Willie Green maybe can focus a little more on the team. Yeah. I agree. Uh, he trusts his players. His players trust him. Mm -hmm. They don't have enough right now to be don't. to make a significant push. Right. They could maybe sneak into a play-in. Mm -hmm. But you're right. They need to try and add something at the trading deadline. They need some more veteran leadership. Some scoring. Uh, they need some scoring. They're playing uh, much better defense than we've seen in the past. They're playing better defense. They uh, or playing together well. I'm not too concerned about this three-game losing streak I'm because of the level These of the competition. These are up echelon teams. Right. Yeah, and, and maybe they don't see Steph Curry tonight. We'll not see. Right. Uh, and then, But it gets easier. It's Toronto, mm -hmm. Minnesota, and mm -hmm. it's a lot easier after tonight. So we'll see. Well, they but, had their first winning months in December, 7-5. and five. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they, they, were, they were playing above 500 ball for a while there until they've run into this, you know, yeah. these two, three top teams. No, they, they finished the calendar year on... A positive note. I wrote about this mm -hmm. at CrescentCitySports.com after the Cleveland win. Uh, so that this could be a pretty good season for them, but it's good that we now look at it in the context of this team without right. Zion right. Williamson. I to agree. Just get that out of the way. Mm -hmm. It's just a distraction. Right. Let's see what Willie Green and the players who are out there can do mm -hmm. maybe they grow maybe they don't but right. let's let's judge right. them on who they are in the context of who's available mm -hmm. and it hopefully Brandon right. Ingram gets through this Achilles soreness and gets back to being what he was because yes. just a week or two ago he was playing his best basketball oh, really of the year and he struggled since since his soreness has popped up I'm with you I'm with you I agree with everything you've said and, and, and hopefully the only thing that, that, that scares me a little bit is David Griffin um, it, 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 with his back against the wall, making a deal, okay, uh, much like we saw Dell Demps at one time. It, it's hard when you got a general manager on the hot seat making deals. Hopefully, again, if there is a deal made, that deal is a good deal and a good deal for this team going forward and not just with a little plug-in to try to be able to get over the hump. Yeah, it's better to make no deal than to force, try and force something that doesn't make sense. 100% agree. Uh, something that was long overdue happened uh, this week. Uh, the, uh, the, the floor of the court at LSU uh, and the PMAC was renamed uh, Dale Brown Court. 
Now, I'm a guy that, again, since I've had the, the privilege of having a microphone, uh, have been pushing for Dale Brown Court based on what Dale Brown did in resurrecting the LSU basketball program after Pistol Pete Maverick took his show uh, to the NBA. Uh, you look at 448 wins, winning a uh, coach in history. Uh, you've got uh, 13 uh, uh, appearances in, in, uh, in, in the NCAA tournament, two Final Fours. You look at, again, everything he's done in terms of, again, not just internationally uh, uh, recruiting players nationally, but what he did here in Louisiana. Uh, what he's done off the floor as well as what he's done on the floor for, for, for LSU and just for, for humanity, it is, a, it is long overdue. With that said, I can't tell you how disappointed I was when, when the TV, uh, 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 when the camera flipped onto the, the floor and, and Dale Brown gets a little piece of the corner of the floor opposite LSU's bench where most coaches, when a floor is named after them, you know, they get a prominent place within that floor, either the end line, maybe, again, the, 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 uh, uh, the, ha the half-court circle. In this case, it was almost like the board of supervisors saying, reluctantly, okay, we will rename the floor for Dale Brown. And again, to me, it was kind of a, a backhanded slap in the face of Dale Brown, but, but an honor, nevertheless, that was long overdue. Your thoughts? Well, they renamed the out-of-bounds for him. Yes. <laughs> That's you know, not really part of the inbounds court. Uh, um, I'm not overly concerned about it because he, he is getting the recognition he deserved. Yes, he they does. did it while he and his family could be there to Which was big. enjoy it. And that was big. I wish it were a little more prominent. I expected it to be a little more Me prominent. Too. But um, Dale Brown is one of the most significant characters in the history of LSU athletics. Okay, you look at that basketball program. He did something, and I wrote about this the other night. He did something Pete Maravich could not do, Bob Pettit could not do. He got people to care about the program. Right. When Pete was there, people would go watch Pete play in the freshman game and leave yes. before the varsity showed up. At the old Cow up, Palace, right? At the old Cow Palace. Then when Pete was on the varsity, they would go watch him. Right. And then when Pete left to go to the NBA, they didn't care until Dale Brown came along. And Bob Pettit had no lasting impact on interest in the program. True. P the program is coming back now. It waned a little bit, but Will mm -hmm. Wade has it doing well now. But there's a foundation that belongs to Dale Brown that led to John Brady building a Final Four mm -hmm. team, to Will Wade getting yes. them back in the top 25 on mm -hmm. a semi-regular basis. That's all Dale Brown. Dale Brown built that. Dale Brown brought Shaquille O'Neal yes. to LSU. Shaquille O'Neal loves LSU. Mm -hmm. He's one of the most beloved LSU students in history. True. He comes back to football games. Mm -hmm. He's adored. Dale Brown did that. Dale Brown brought in Rudy Macklin, right. one of the most significant athletes in LSU history. And, and Dwayne Scales right. and Ethan Martin and Chris Jackson, Chris right. Jackson, one of the elite players. Mm -hmm. His numbers retired, right. along with Macklin and right. Shaquille, right. Bob That's, Pettit, and Maravich. Bob Pettit and Maravich. That's all because of Dale Brown, right. and nobody cared about LSU basketball from the time Pete Maravich walked out of the, true. the building until Dale Brown really took him to the Final Four in 1981. Mm -hmm. Nobody cared about LSU basketball. Now they're a little fickle. You got to win for them mm -hmm. to care. Right. But if you win, they care a lot. Yes. And that didn't happen before Dale Brown. 25 years, two Final Fours. Right. He made a huge difference. And you can talk about Paul Dietzel, you can talk about Nick Saban, mm -hmm. you can talk about all these people. They didn't do the building job that Dale Brown right. did. They all had something. Football goes back forever. Mm -hmm. Dale Brown made that program important, and the success they have now would not have happened as easily if not for what Dale Brown did. He deserves all the credit in the world. I think he's very much respected by most in the LSU community, yes. but still underappreciated Under. for his impact. Right. And again, I want to say it before we leave this, I don't want to leave this out. You know, there was a scandal with Lester Earl supposedly being paid with a shoebox full of money. That's been rebunked. That's been debunked. 
Lester Earl said he was under pressure from the NCAA to lie. Ultimately, that was the, 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 the way that, again, uh, Dale Brown was ultimately pushed out. Some can say the program waned. What was hard when, again, scholarships were being taken out away from you and ultimately, again, having, again, the cloud of the NCAA. If anything, Dale Brown was the one coach in the NCAA, along with Tarkanian, who stood up to the NCAA constantly, fighting right. for his players, fighting for student-athletes. He was an amazing man, an amazing coach, and uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they did something for him. I'm sad that, again, they did so little and it took so long. Yeah. It's not a coincidence that Dale Brown <laughs> called out the NCAA for taking advantage of student-athletes and then he himself became the target of right. the NCAA. That's not a coincidence. Same thing with Jerry Tarkanian. And getting back briefly to the NIL, the long overdue freedoms that student athletes are getting right. now happen in some small part because Dale Brown was standing on the mountaintop yes. screaming, this is not right. Exactly. And it took forever for other people right. to figure it out, but Dale Brown had the guts to point it out when nobody else would. Yes, he did. And, and again, it hurt him with the NCAA. Yeah. They constantly were going after him to the point where, again, fabricating a story with a, with a, a prominent player from Louisiana in order for him to go to Kansas and continue his, his, his uh, ability to play basketball to be able to, uh, to push this on a, look, most people could go to jail for that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, fabricating something like that. And of course, it really kind of tainted his legacy. Uh, you go for Might have circle. shortened his career. I think it did. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Again, uh, no, he should be revered for everything he's done on and off the floor at LSU. And again, I'm, I'm happy that it happened. I'm, I'm, I kind of think it's kind of. Uh, uh, it's kind of a backhanded compliment the way they did it. Hopefully, mm -hmm. again, uh, down the line here. Look, I know it's Pete, I know it's Pete Maravich's Zombie Center, and I know the Tigers on both end lines. I know who they are. Mm -hmm. Do it the right way, okay? Mm -hmm. Put the man's name prominently on the court, as it should have been. Yeah, I agree. I, I wish it had been done more prominently because he deserved that. Yes. But at least we're sitting here now acknowledging how important he is in the history of LSU right. athletics. And, and no doubt about it. There's no doubt. And when you look at it in the big scheme of things, you mentioned something to me a little bit earlier that's so true. Uh, this, there may have some individuals that have a grudge against Dale Brown, but they sure don't look the other way on Will Wade, don't they? Yeah. You know, Will Wade is on tape with the NCAA saying something that can only be reasonably interpreted as a violation of NCAA rules. But this story broke when LSU was about to win an SEC championship. Mm -hmm. So, so far, Will Wade has survived. Right. But, but the investigation is not over, and uh, the only thing he has going for him is that he's winning. Let's right. see how long that keeps and, up. And again, you look at, at Dale Brown, based on, again, the false accusations by the NCAA, he ran a clean program. Ran a clean program. And again, was a successful program as well. Les, as always, thanks so much for being with us. We wanted to talk a little bit about Pistol Pete, but we ran out of time. Uh, but maybe we'll do that next time you come on the program. Great. Les East, again, CrestedSports.com. And the name of the book? Donkeys, Elephants, and Giraffes. you got to read it to understand it. There you go. Get out there and get the book as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, there are plenty of ways to be able to catch our program now. We have our first rebroadcast tonight at 6 p.m. on WLAE TV, 10 o'clock on The Deuce, WLAE TV 2, Friday night, 9 o'clock, Pelican Sports Television, 10 o'clock on WLAE, and then, of course, Saturday morning at 2 a.m. on The Deuce, Saturday afternoon at 5 p.m. on Pelican Sports Television. Always at ericasher.com, always on our social media platforms, at eric underscore asher on Twitter, Eric Asher on Facebook and Inside New Orleans show on Instagram. Also, again, always on the WLE TV YouTube page as well as ericasher.com. Again, special thanks to um, our sponsors, our underwriters that make this show possible. Please continue to support those underwriters. And you catch me on the radio uh, four to six weekdays on 106.1 FM. You can listen live at ericasher.com. Also, the TuneIn Radio app, the iHeartRadio app, as well as our podcast is on the Anchor app, but we're on all applications out there when it comes to podcasts. Again, um, I want to thank our, our guest today, Les East. Also, uh, again, the, the staff here at WLE does a great job. Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, also um, Alex Chacon, and the best director in the business. That would be William Hill. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope, hope you, uh, wish you a happy new year. Wish you a happy King's Day, happy 12th night. And we'll see you next week for another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. Thanks for watching. <laughs>